good afternoon uh, for all of you who attending this uh, wonderful conference and this morning uh, dr deva chopra and dr jill miller's presentation was amazing and uh, i attended and they already touched on some of the things we are also going to share with you and what i'm going to do is nothing but a reflective experience of my field studies among different ethnic enclaves in los angeles uh, and as a matter of fact uh, i was reading uh, literature and show that almost uh, every other person in the city of los angeles was born outside united states and they speak more than 100 languages so uh, you name the country there are people uh, who are american citizen or uh, legal residents who live in this area so with this kind of a diversity and los angeles is blessed with all kinds of traditions and which maybe we should be able to experiment with um, these traditions involve uh, not only that particular family's uh, unique lifestyle you are looking at their uh, grocery store to their restaurants to their own cultural uh, uh, enclaves out here and the latest uh, i counted almost 23 specific ethnic enclaves uh, all the way from chinatown to armenian town to ethiopian town and uh, it would be nice if you could venture out and walk around and get a feel of it the other day uh, only five blocks from our main campus at usc uh, I came across a, a vegan uh, Ethiopian restaurant. And typically people think in Ethiopia there are not vegans. And I happen to be a vegan. And I went there. It is a, a wonderful food up there, you know, the vegan food from Ethiopia. And so that kind of a diversity is very much here. And we, we are blessed with that kind of a thing. And while you are there, uh, not only really just purchasing things and and look around and you will see uh, all kinds of people out there, hopefully from their own ethnic community, but even uh, from outside their ethnic community are there. And uh, some of the very popular ones you might uh, notice in Chinatown, they have herbal uh, stores and though they cannot call themselves herbal doctors and they bring thousands of thousands of years of their traditions and healing practices and and they put to practice you know but unfortunately our um, uh, society is not yet willing to accept them as a hmm. uh, as a formal way of healing things around you know there are all kinds of check and balances there we all need that one but at least we need to be open to their way modalities of uh, healing and for example, in the uh, Japan town, and you will see uh, they have their own uh, uh, different types of healing practices there. And you go to the India town and uh, you will see they have their own Ayurveda and other kinds of uh, healing practices. So uh, experimenting with them and this would be unique. And also there are literature out there which uh, uh, talk about you know this uh, uh, the thousands of hundreds of years of these healing practices and it is still very much practiced you know especially among the elders among these communities and it really works their practice wisdom is something unique you may want to uh, look at it also systematically the 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 the, the whole challenge uh, we faced in our society is uh, not trusting each other and we always have a skeptical attitude to things which we are not uh, commonly aware of you know that is something we may need to throw that out and and try to experiment and see what happens you know eating all the way from their food to uh, practicing that or at least observing their rituals and that is what uh, my colleague uh, 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 Fidel is going to do it because he had worldwide travel experience and he was actually initiated into uh, some African tribes and 
uh, and he himself practiced these different healings and uh, not only in this area and he travels quite a bit and now he's even working with uh, teenagers in the Los Angeles area. Perhaps maybe we could hear from uh, uh, Fidel about his practice uh, experience and uh, not only the local community, but from other uh, traveling experiences. And by the way, he just came back from a ritualistic ceremony and he's still outdoor out there. So uh, perhaps maybe uh, uh, Fidel share with us, you know, I know you have a few slides also, take your own time and then uh, we'll have some question and answer also, you know. Uh, thank you, Di oh, Dr. Sure. Nair. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, you brought us some, some interesting points. Um, you mentioned in, in the, the ethnic enclaves in LA, you know, where you have, you mentioned thousands of years of medicines and, and healing herbals. And, and unfortunately they can't call themselves herbal doctors. And then there's a society, right? A, a Western society that doesn't want to acknowledge things that have been working to help people heal for thousands of years. So um, I'm glad you're pointing that out to me. I feel like there's a huge paradigm shift happening, not only in academia, but obviously in the health world. To see a conference like this happening and all the 55 different, you know, uh, topics that are happening and rooms that are happening, um, being involved in this type of stuff for the last, you know, 15, 20 years, it, it's actually, I can, it's seeing the paradigm shift shifting. So um, I'm very blessed to be part of this. And thank you, Dr. Nair and, and USC for, you know, getting us there. Um, okay, so I am going to share a PowerPoint and I'll try to run through it. Um, as Dr. Nair mentioned, my name is Fidel Rodriguez. Um, I just came out of a ceremony um, with what is called the bufo, the toad medicine uh, at a Sonora, Mexico or Mexico. Um, we can talk a little bit about that after, but um, this is what I'm, I'm calling uh, Native American, Mexican, and African healing tools in the city of angels, uh, decolonizing the mind, body, and spirit. And let's see, um, I'm just going to touch upon um, rituals, the concept of Hunapku from the Mayan, uh, the spiritual tradition known as Ifa out of Nigeria. Uh, as well as uh, back into Ifa, Santeria, Espiritismo, Curanderismo, um, which are both African, Latin, or Latino, or Hispanic, as Dr. Nair calls sometimes, <laughs> and Native American, and then as well as the Bufo, a various, uh, known as the Sapo or Toad medicine. So I wanted to start with rituals, because I think rituals, oops, uh, rituals play a huge part, and I keep trying to move this thing around so I could actually see my screen. Um, rituals make us no longer passive beings. Um, and I'm so sorry, I can't. Okay, there we go. I can't see that. There we go. Now I can, I just couldn't see the screen. Yeah, I can't. Oh, oh. Yeah, I couldn't see it. <laughs> rituals make us no longer passive beings in the cosmos, but we become creative agents of existence. And rituals generate a sense of certainty and familiarity. They provide continuity, continuity among those who perform or attend them. In turn, people find a degree of, uh, of identity, of identified thought, its common observance and experience. It's from uh, John S. Uh, Mbidi, who studied a lot of African religions in Africa. I love this quote because this kind of couples everything that we're talking about. As Dr. Nair talked about the westernization, not recognizing a lot of these traditions. Albert Einstein was quoted, everyone who is seriously interested in the pursuit of science becomes convinced that a spirit is manifest in the laws of the universe, a spirit vastly superior to man and one in the face of which our modest powers must seem humble. And I mention this because all of these traditions, whether they're in Mexico, South America, Africa, Southeast Asia, Laos, China, what have you, had an understanding of this spirit that he's talking about. And we're talking about quantum physics. We're talking about Newtonian physics, both matter and spirit, that a lot of these indigenous traditions, in particular the ones I'm gonna talk about, had an understanding with that within the culture. Hunapku is a concept from the Mayan. Uh, it's known as soul source, measure and movement, 
symbolized the universe for the Maya in the form of a circle and an inscribed square. The circle was a symbol of the infinite, the spiritual, the square of the material. And if you think about it, it's like the Pythagoras theory uh, theorem, uh, which was a square with a circle within it. So we're talking about quantum and we're talking about Newtonian all in one. And this is a concept that the Mayans had thousands of years ago um, and is still practiced. This is, if you look at it, it looks like the, the Mayan yin yang, right? It looks like the Mayan yin yang. And it is, has been said that the Mayan came to the ma mathematical certainty of the existence of a cosmic consciousness, which they named Hunapku, sole dispenser of measure and movement to whom they attributed the mathematical structuring of the universe. Hunapku was thus a universal dynamism or that which motivates and stimulates life in its total manifestation as spirit and matter, the all in one. Essentially that matter and spirit are all one. Um, the Mayans also have a concept called, um, okay, there we go. Uh, also have a concept called um, Ometeo. Um, they also have, uh, it's just like the yin and yang. So I wanted to get into Ifa. Ifa is a tradition that came over in the slave trade. And I'm gonna make the connections because a lot of these things that I'm talking about are embedded in Los Angeles. Uh, Arumila to them was known as the God of wisdom. Ifa is the system of esoteric worship. Arumila is deemed the prophet of the Yoruba religion and culture out of Nigeria. It was he who developed and expounded upon the system of esoteric worship known to this day as Ifa. When we're talking about esoteric, we're talking about hidden knowledge that, that only few know about. Arumila saw that the dual levels of potentiality existed. Again, back to the yin and yang, the Hunapku concept, matter and spirit. Through him, we understand that the study of animate and inanimate, manifest and unmanifest, visible and in, invisible, worlds lead to fundamental understandings of the self, ontology, and that the fundamental understanding bring about the evolution of human spirit which in turn encourages divine behavior, worldly progression and expanded cosmology. So this system allows people to get connected back to their spirit through the cosmos. Okay, I am having the worst problem going to the next slide with this. There we go. So Ifa, um, a Lodumar's God coded messages manifest to mankind by Arumila. So if you think about the Ifa divination system, okay, it's kind of like a mathematical equation that people come to get readings to be able to find out their connection to the source of, of if we want to call it the infinite, in order to understand what's going on in the matter. So Ifa divination system makes use of extensive corpuses of text and mathematical formulas is practiced among the Yoruba communities and by the African di diaspora in the Americas and the Caribbean. The word Ifa refers to the mystical figure Ifa or Urumila regarded by the Yoruba um, as the deity of wisdom and intellectual development. Ifa literally corpus called the Odu, these are octogram diagrams, consists of 256 parts subdivided into verses called Ese, whose exact number is unknown as they are constantly increasing. They are around 800 Ese per Odu. So we're talking about chapters, we're talking about marking. So if you had one to 256, each of those numbers carry with them about 800 stanzas and messages. There's 16 major markings and 240 combinations of those markings um, that have a specific divination signature, which is determined by a Baba Lao, which is a high priest using sacred palm nuts and or a divination chain known as the Opuele. The essay, which are like stanzas, considered the most important part of the Ifa divination are chanted by the priest in poetic language. These essay reflect the Yoruba history language beliefs Cosmo visions and contemporary social issues. The knowledge of Ifa has been preserved with the Yoruba communities and transmit, transmitted among Ifa priests. So the Odus are basically binary mathematics. The offerings that come for a person's reading when a client comes would be known as particle physics because physics, um, particle physics is like sometimes you have to offer oranges to the river. Sometimes you have to take a watermelon to the ocean. All of these aspects of God, as the system would show, are parts of nature. So when you look at the Ifa systemic um, paradigm, there's 256 chapters, as you can see on here. These 16 markings that you see in front of you, there's 240 combinations of those. 
when a person comes to get a reading, a human being comes to get divination from someone, one of these markings or combinations of these markings falls and they have over 1600 stanzas for each of the markings, which are basically human stories. Because it, it, Ifa, in Ifa, they say that nothing new has happened under the sun for human beings. Human beings have been going over the same issues, whether it's dealing with relationships, whether it's dealing with health, whether it's dealing with money issues. Um, the opuela is uh, a divining tool that is used. When it's face down, it's known as ogbemeji. When it's faced up, it's known as, or excuse me, ogbemeji. When it's faced up, it's ogbemeji. When it's face down, it's oyukumeji. Just an example. These are used for the purpose of, of divination or casting the opuela, um, which will give you the chapter or the odu, which will give, uh, in a mystic sense, it calls down the heavenly entity for the person. What comes in a reading for a person is either it comes in ire, which is longevity, wealth, health, spouse, children, professional choices, success, et cetera, or it could come in ayewo, which means inquiry. No matter, even if something came in inquiry, there's always room to investigate and find out what's going on with the person in their lives. If it's related to health, if it's related to relationships, if it's related to a job, um, it can come in death, but that does, doesn't mean death of a person. It can mean death of a job, death of the relationship, um, it, it doesn't necessarily mean life and death um, in terms of what we think about physically. Affliction, litigation, loss, trouble, sickness, etc. So the, for the person, the reading comes in either or. I'm giving you this background knowledge because I want to show you the profoundness that these images are in LA all the time, but we're so disconnected. This is a 10,000 year old tradition. So if you look at Lukumi, or which is the African process of, let's see, There we go. Ifa, Santeria, Lukumi, okay? Ifa is from Africa. Santeria was Ifa mixed into the Catholic religion, became Santeria, and then Lukumi was more of the African presence in Cuba of Ifa, of the Ifa system. Ashe is something that all human beings have. It's life force, right? If we think of the Star Wars, we're talking about the force. It's the power to bring things into existence or the power to make things happen. So when a person comes to get a reading, they come to figure out how can they manifest their ashe. Eshu is one of the gods, the god of justice. It's a divinity, um, uh, is viewed primarily as the powerful holder of the ashe or creative potency for all the other rishas, which are aspects of nature. For this reason, all sacrifices and offerings must be shared with Eshu in some manner. Okay, he's the, he's the messenger of divinity who also delivers sacrifices to the Orishas from humans and from one Orisha to another. He is in close proximity to all forces, positive and negative alike, and he is the prime negotiator between them. Now, I mentioned this, Eshu. Eshu is the crossroads. Eshu, the, these two pictures you see here, one is talking about Ashe, and you see a picture of Eshu is the little brock with the... the the two cowrie shells and the nose as a cowrie shell and the mouth of the cowrie shell. And then on the other picture, you see all kinds of shoes that are being sold in a botanica. These pictures were taken in Huntington Park, which is carrying a very ancient and esoteric tradition from Africa that came here through the slave trade. Again, an ethnic enclave of an ethnicity that was um, connecting you know, these traditions in LA. Ashe again um, is in everything. It's in gods, it's in ancestors, it's in spirits, it's in humans, it's in animals and plants, rocks, rivers, voice words such as songs, prayers, etc. So this is a picture of uh, a botanica in Highland Park, which is called Ashe. Again, the power to manifest things. Again, uh, a word that has been brought over through the slave trade and manifested into our 21st century in, in LA. Um, the African market. Uh, this is a place in LA in, uh, off of Washington and La Brea where you can buy Ifa foods and offerings. Um, it's called, this one is called Obichi. In here, you can buy a kola net or known as Obiabada. It's one of the highest ways that you can do divination and offerings for Ifa. Um, it's offered to the Orisha for a variety of reasons. It's kind of like a Eucharist of sorts, a way of communicating with the deities and offering. It's a basic oracle. It opens up and it breaks into four parts, two male, two female. When they fall, they make a combination that gives the diviner either a yes, no answer or kind of who to offer things to. Um, again, it could be bought in this ethnic enclave that we live, uh, live in. So because of the slave trade, because of colonization, there was a lot of mixtures of ethnicities throughout the world. 
Um, Spanish came bringing a lot of herbalism. Africans obviously brought Ifa and other spiritual traditions. And then you even have Espiritismo, which was a ancestral worship tradition that came out of France. They got mixed in with everything. And then of course you have Santeria. This is a Botanica that if you go on with pre-COVID, you could go in here and you'd see a, a long group of people waiting to get readings, to get divination done, to get limpialas done, to be able to clean energy off the person so they can manifest their ashe. The last thing that I wanna talk about was the bufo, alvarius, the sapo, opec, the toad medicine. This is something that I've been able to encounter over the last year. It's a medicine out of the Sonora des Desert. It comes, uh, specifically this one is the Colorado River toad. Um, also known as the Sonora Desert Toad, is found in northern Mexico and southwestern United States. Its toxin, or I would say its medicine, uh, is exudiated out of glands within the skin. It contains what is known as 5-MeO-DMT uh, and bufotenin. So 5-MeO-DMT has been known as the God molecule. It has been known to be able to open up the pineal gland and take the participant that's in the ritual to basically base jump into the heart of God, as, as uh, some people have said. It is a place that I've seen people go into the healing and remove years and decades of trauma and uh, psychological trauma, emotional trauma that they've been carrying from 10, 20, 30 years. Um, and to be able to get, and I, you know, I can, I can witness that I've witnessed a lot of people go through just anything from you know 20 to 30 years of therapy in 20 minutes. It connects you to source, it connects you to Hunapku, it connects you to the quantum field, um, but it allows you to get yourself back into the essence of what we'd like to say is the epitome and the profoundness of pure love. Um, with deep gratitude, um, this is my one of my initiations in the state of Oyo in Nigeria for a, a deity known as Shango, who was um, is the god of thunder and lightning and of truth. So that is my quick rundown of three different uh, ethnic groups of spiritual traditions right here in beautiful Los Angeles. Thank you all so much for your presentation, Dr. Nair, Mr. Rodriguez. To start off, how did you both become interested in this topic? Yeah, maybe you want to start fiddle and then I'll continue. Okay. Are you sure? Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you, Dr. Nair. You know, it, it, for me, I, I went through a lot of trauma as a child, a lot of trauma as a teenager and even a young adult, um, almost wound up in prison. Didn't know anything about my own cultural background as a Mexican American, as a Native American born and raised in the United States in California, who has ancestry whew, six to seven generations in Santa Barbara. So even prior to this being the United States, I have ancestors that were here, but grew up not knowing anything about that. So eventually I would find a mentor. I almost went to prison at 22. Thank God I didn't. I ended up uh, reading a book of autobiography on Malcolm X and it gave me insight and a reflection of like, wow, I wonder if my ancestors had, were, were, had leadership, just simple people that outspoke about things that were happening in our world. And from that, I met a mentor and he kind of just took somewhere like Dr. Nair came into my life and began to feed me information teach me about goals, but then eventually I wanted to know what my ancestors practiced in terms of spirituality and religion. And I went to USC and it just, the, the, the onion kept getting peeled back one piece after another. And I was blessed to go and do a study abroad in, in Zimbabwe through my USC program, as well as I stayed some time in Korea through USC, through South America. I'm pumping it up because USC literally opened the world for me to, to not only be educated, but to learn about my cultural roots. And it's in the most profound way that it's changed my life completely. Yeah, uh, thank you for sharing, uh, Fidel. For me, uh, Jamie, by looking at you, looking at me, you know that though I say I am an American, uh, they said, no, no, you are not from here. And uh, let me give you a humorous thing. and. Uh, we lived about seven different places in the United States. I was born in the Spice Mountain area in the southwest corner of India. My, I came when I was young, a little bit, you know, and went to school here and I uh, travel. And even at a very young age, and 
I used to backpack and uh, travel, you know, and I went to all the continents so far. And uh, my family consists of about at least 15 MDs, you know, and uh, from our extended family, they are in modern medicine. And my own uh, father was a physician, but he was very much into alternative medicine also. And I have seen uh, growing up that way he is utilizing that. Uh, alternative traditional medicine for a lot of things, you know, for healing purposes. And um, also I was hanging around with a lot of elders and observing and um, there, there is something, but slowly, slowly you all know now, uh, I give a couple of lectures at our own uh, uh, Kirk Medical School on these ethnic enclaves and alternative medicine kind of a concepts, you know, and um, it is very much there, but some of us are not willing to take that element of risk to learn more about it. And if you look at the uh, medical uh, uh, textbook, as a, as a matter of fact, me and my one of my former student, we wrote an article on the, the, the healthy centenarians, their lifestyle factors in a medical textbook, all the way it's in a gastroenterology book, you know, and, and my own, daughter is a physician and she is saying that dad what do you know about medicine and how can you write a chapter in a medical textbook you know and i think at least we have that multidisciplinary approach is there you don't have to be a, a physician and i think we need to keep our eyes open in terms of mm. grasping the, the 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 knowledge out there and it could be from a lay person by virtue of they don't have the title md or other uh, things, you know, like we are talking before, but we should be able to uh, experiment, but I am glad now the medical school, including Keck, is very much uh, willing to accept some of those things, you know, and the, under the concept evidence-based research, you know, and we are slowly venturing it out, though it is happening thousands of years in other countries, all the way from the African tribe uh, 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 federal went to, and you look at I, I was a Fulbright scholar. I was in Sri Lanka and I stayed with traditional Buddhist uh, healers out in the village area. They hardly could speak English, you know, but I had, I had a participant observation and it's a beautiful experience. I made a video on uh, uh, the, their uh, Sri Lanka experience as such, you know, and mm -hmm. so we need to keep our uh, eyes open. And uh, the, the whole concept of, if you look at the modern medicine, and we have a tendency of the sublimial messages, you know, and with the, nothing wrong with the medicine, but the pharmaceutical company and others, you know, who really control our uh, yeah. uh, the yeah. traditions. And we are all under making money. There is nothing wrong with making money, but uh, the pain and sufferings of others. And they come up with the sublimial messages saying that you take a couple of this medicine, you know, you'll be all right, you know, but I think, uh, <laughs> And of all of us, you know, who are in this profession or closely related to this profession, you know, and we need to do a mass education. And I'm very, very yeah. happy in this conference. Uh, since its beginning, I have been affiliated with this. This is the fourth year we are doing this thing, you know. And uh, uh, at least we are uh, scratching the surface. And uh, we all need to be the leader and pass this around, you know, to others. And that's what my suggestion also is, you know. You brought up evidence-based practices, right? Yeah. Why do you think, it, it seems a bit ironic that for societies and civilizations around the world, whether they be from Africa or India or Asia for that matter, that have been kind of practicing traditional medicines, that like people are, whether it's going to do Tai Chi or get acupuncture done or even you know, this medicine that I've just witnessed, the healer from Mexico, just, you know, an hour and a half ago, um, not only for myself, but other people that you're seeing profound changes immediately happening. But we still are under this, this auspices of, we gotta need evidence-based, evidence-based. So I said, well, is it 5,000 years of civilization, like enough? Like, do you uh, ever think there's gonna be- let me give you an example. Uh, for example, uh, the pharmaceutical thing, the medications we create, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. 
some of my own uh, uh, medical relatives were saying that 90% of this chemical derivatives, you know, uh, it, it comes from a plant-based. And uh, mm -hmm. they go in and uh, out into the, uh, they call it uh, uh, ethno uh, something, pharmac pharmacology or something like that. These chemists and other scientists, they go into these traditional communities and learn from them and get the chemical derivatives, you know, and then uh, yeah, come in. From the ethnogens. Yeah, but unfortunately, uh, federal, uh, they hardly acknowledge, you know, even if you look in the scientific article or otherwise, uh, they do not say that uh, they learn this from such and such a cultural base or otherwise, you know. Yeah, and, yeah. And it's really sad. There are some countries, uh, uh, even in South America, you know, and they were, uh, telling that uh, uh, they come there and they look at the trees and their box and other things, what the mm -hmm. local community is using for what healing practices. And then yeah. they, they get the idea here and then they make millions of dollars profit. No yeah, they, they create synthetic medicines out of it. That is it. Yeah. So yeah. I think you know, what I'm we, we are looking at our own community, you know, and you look at- Yes in New York City and they have a huge uh, ethnic enclaves there you know and uh, yeah, you know, yeah I lived in Ohio Cleveland and they also have ethnic enclaves and wherever we go and I think uh, we need to be flexible to at least go and uh, learn what they are doing instead of negating saying that look there yeah. is no theory there is no evidence-based studies on and this really works you know this really works yeah. This really works. Well, I, 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 yeah, you know, what, what I've been seeing. Go ahead. I'm sorry. In my culture, we use garlic. You know, mm. when you eat the real garlic, it smells. So now uh, I was looking at a, a company who's marketing a garlic pill. They said, if you take this garlic pill, it doesn't smell. So people want to pop a couple of these things. Uh, do you think that as a real medical value of that garlic? No, but the way they package it, they way show you at the real garlic's image picture, you know. And uh, so uh, that is something, you know, uh, I don't know, Jamie, you have a background. Are you planning to be a physician or Mahak? Are you planning to study? That was the plan, yes. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, I think people like youngsters like you, you, you need to keep that in mind, you know, instead of negating. And, it is really sad, you know, if you look at the literature and I have been looking through the medical textbooks and all, you know, and we, we hardly they acknowledge, you know, that yes, the, the traditional healing is still good, you know, and they, they talk about, you know, the, the clinical based, evidence based, experimental based. There is nothing wrong with that. We, we do need that, but at least collaborate with people. And if you look at the, all the modern medical journals and all, you know, and uh, where it is coming from, mainly Europe and uh, North America, you know. Uh, what is wrong with yeah. Africa and Asia and somewhere or other, you know, we need to take that particular risk. I know sometimes our own colleagues may not uh, uh, accept that particular uh, way of thinking, you know. Well, and, yeah, well, now, yeah. now you're bringing up the stigma of yeah. racism towards, especially people of color from around the world. And so you got that playing in there as well so you're dissecting all these different elements you know what i mean so we do have one question from the audience uh, this is from elise are you going to make a movie about all the forms of healing in la as a matter of fact i i got a 10 minutes documentary jamie i i put it up i had a small research grant i had a couple of graduate students from usc we went around to this traditional healers and uh, and uh, we documented some of those things and I put my uh, uh, website here. I don't know if you look, can you see it all right, uh, Jamie, at the beginning? Yes, I think Mahak sent it to all the attendees. Yes, yeah, yes. I see it and, too. Yeah, that is the website, you know, it's there and Fiddle, there are quite a few out there also available, you know. Uh, Fiddle, are you familiar with any documentaries on traditional healers that you know there's one that's on um netflix and i'm completely having a blank 
about it, but I'll, I'll try to look it up right now. Um, yeah, it kind of covers a lot of medicines that are happening in Mexico. It does one on ayahuasca. Um, it does stuff on, on Taoism. There's a, the, yeah, there's a few of them out there. I don't, I'm trying to, you know, one that I just watched um, called the Pharmacratic Inquisition. The Pharmacratic Inquisition you can find on YouTube. And that one is on the, the mushroom, the, uh, um, the psilocybin mushroom, which can be found all over the world. But when you kind of start unveiling it, um, it, it, you begin to find, so in Mexico, they call mushrooms, right? If you want to call them psychedelic mushrooms as the flesh of God, which have been used for thousands of years, not only in, in the Americas, but also in Europe. Um, some, I mean, there's a, a book by Dr. Joe, um, Oh man, uh, Gregorio, and he wrote. He was one of ten um, linguists and anthropologists that were asked to decipher the Dead Sea Scrolls. And in his part that he deciphered, he came to the realization that God in the Christian tradition was actually the mushroom, and that the priests in in in, in the Catholic priest system, if you look at a lot of the red and white garber. They were actually reflections of the mushroom, which was the red and white mushroom that they had in Europe. So there, it's, I'm saying that when you start to unveil this stuff, and this is all from this documentary, so you can YouTube it it's for free. It's called the uh, Pharmacratic uh, Inquisition. Um, and it really talks about these medicines that can be found here in LA, of course. Um, here's the other thing about a lot of these ceremonies and rituals. And this even includes getting acupuncture or doing yoga is that the Western mind tends to kind of take this information and leave out the spiritual component of it. I mean, even this web, this, this wellness um, conference, they left spirit out. It was mind, body, soul, maybe, I don't know. I can't remember the thing, but I was like, oh, they left out spirit. You can't have spirit. You can't have anything. All spirit means in Sanskrit is breath. That's all it means, which is chi, right? So it's kind of like this, this, this play on stuff is that I've noticed that in yoga, yoga means to unite one with the universe, right? But we, we tend to kind of leave out those major things. The political system in the United States is based on the Iroquois nation confederacy, city councils, what have you. One of the things that they left out was a spiritual connection that all those tribes had before they had discussions about things. They would do a sweat together. They would go on vision quests together. In our political system, are we doing that? No because we left that part of the tradition out, which I believe all traditions connect that. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, I'll try to look up that documentary on, on uh, Netflix. Well, you know, by so. the way, there is another interesting question about, is there any hospitals in this area using traditional healing? As a matter of fact, when we had a Cambodian refugees came into this area, I think it is UCLA, maybe I am uh, wrong, one of the hospitals, and they let the traditional healers uh, from Cambodia come to the hospitals and uh, while the patients were there and they found out that when the traditional healer come and bless them and they get out early with the same presenting problem compared to the patients not uh, were uh, allowed to have the traditional healers come in you know uh, i think there are some uh, very interesting article also out there if you could take a look at it you know and also the diet when they are allowed mm. to have their yes. ethnic diet, I know we are preoccupied with salt and other things, you know, but even we, we can control their things, you know, and let them have it. And uh, the, the healing uh, happens much faster, you know, that's what uh, they are talking about. So um, I, I also go into uh, some hospitals and uh, do a kind of a, a laughter session with them and mindfulness session and and uh, though some of them are skeptical i think you know it, it really works and but we should be flexible to accommodate unfortunately in our society we are preoccupied with this liability you know what happened if you uh, <laughs> do something the insurance company and all for example only very lately what? allowing uh, yoga to be used meditation and breathing you know yeah. and uh, they are allowing them yeah, and one more uh, example uh, uh, I can give you is uh, uh, there is a new form of uh, yoga called mindfulness yoga. It is nothing but 
you touch each uh, the opposite ear lobe with your hand and take a deep breath and yeah. bow. But in the Indian tradition, you know, uh, we do it in front of a god called Gindapati, you know. And now the person who did the research at Yale Medical School never mentioned that this was practiced in another country, but he said he come up with something new and now uh, <laughs> he's experimenting with uh, children with uh, attention deficit order and people who, uh, with dementia and early phase Alzheimer's. And they said that if you can do this and synchronize your breathing, it really works. You know, you bow, you know, and come up mm. again. And now yeah. uh, I was told uh, in, uh, there is a nice uh, a news clip from the ABC I was watching in uh, Los Angeles area, our uh, Kaiser Permanent Day. And the physicians were uh, asked to do this, you know, and ask the patients when they are not able to communicate properly to talk about their presenting problem and all. They were doing this and they found out that the patients who were asked to do this a couple of times before the physician really sit down and talk to them, they calmed down much more. They were able to remember more, you know. So uh, there are a few research studies coming out here and there. But it is not too much. You know. Let me give you one more example. And I co-authored a book a couple of years ago on the healing uh, traditions and practices. You know, and we look at it cross-nationally. And my co-author was a, a physician from Cleveland Clinic, and my other colleague is an anthropologist. You know, we look at Belize, for example. You know, it's a very small island of uh, South America, Belize. You know, B L I Z. And they do all kinds of uh, herbal medicine there. And, and you are saying that they set up a whole uh, practice modality there. Then uh, people from the United States and others went there. We set up the so-called modern clinic, you know. And they found out people mm -hmm. still using the ancient medical practices versus the new. There is no integration. That is something, you know, we need to practice more well, that, on yeah. integrating. <laughs> That's and the most important part. Also, we try to separate. Yeah, it's that's the most important part, Dr. Nair, is the integration. You know, the yeah, thing yeah. about all these places you're talking about is is living the medicine. Our culture is is it's very difficult to kind of like go into this deep spiritual healing place when you have a culture that's extremely toxic, right? Being in COVID. We're, we have created such a fear-based society, which we know the antithesis, we know what fear does to our immune system. It brings us down, right? But we also know the antithesis of that, of that is love. Love and gratitude also boosts our immune system. There's a, a protein that we have inside of us called immunoglobulin A. It's a primi the, the, the prime protein that actually fights viruses and other foreign uh, things that are inside of our system. But the system, and I'm bringing it back to the culture because everything we're talking about, whether it's the medicines, the pharmaceutical companies, it's built around this, cult, this toxic culture that all of us are kind of living under right now, um, trying to figure out how do we get healthy, right? People are walking around in psychosis right now. You start counting, when your awareness gets to a place, you start realizing how of a humane society we live in when you start seeing families I've seen a lot of fathers and their sons living on the streets and I have conversations with them, but I've noticed that as humanity, we're so disconnected to ourselves, which makes us disconnected to the people that we see. So um, I'm on this journey trying to figure it out to see how as, as a human race, we can change this. And I'm blessed that I'm happy that Jamie and Mahak are both gonna, they, I think you said you wanna be doctors. We need a younger generation. I have hope. Because wellness was not a concept that everybody had. Now that's your paradigm. You know, I'm noticing that I'm hearing medical doctors coming out of, out of, the, out of medical school with the foundation of wellness now. So they're looking at this relationship they're having with their patients in a completely different uh, way that doctors in the past had. Uh, apparently, there is a one question, Jamie. Is it a question and an answer? Can yeah, you yeah. read that? So this question also comes from Elise. How do we help shift the culture? What would you both suggest to help us reconnect? Go ahead, Dr. Nair. I'll, I'll go after you. Um, only, only a few miles from Los Angeles, there is an area. They are part of a blue zone. 
and and uh, uh, can any of you name that town where there are a concentration of people who are 100 plus years old they live up there very healthy that's the only place in the united states the national geographic uh, identified as one of the five or six blue zone in the world where there are healthy centenarians and they also mm. have a, a medical school of their own jamie do you remember that place and there is a the, the whole group of people are mainly they are seventh day adventurist or one of the segment of the christian cohorts and they are vegetarians in general and they have their own unique culture and they have a university also there i'm not sure i can pinpoint um yeah. what exact culture you're getting at but yes yeah anyway uh, uh so i'm talking about there are proof to show that you know a particular lifestyle uh make a big difference in terms of uh, our uh, uh the the life expectancy because i do research or field studies on healthy centenarians looking at people who are 100 plus years old you know and i just came back from uh, costa rica a couple of years ago and i was in china i was in spice mountain in uh, uh india mm -hmm. and uh, sri lanka and all. there are people who are very healthy and uh, and uh, one of the fascinating thing i was looking at subjects who did not use modern medicine maybe use only very little still healthy they were able to live you know so uh, perhaps maybe that is something uh, we may need to explore also uh, in our own society people who are healthy and uh, not depending on modern medicine you know is there anything we can learn that practice wisdom of these elders somewhere or other we negate because they may not have the credential like a md or a phd or uh, other credentials you know and uh, we we need to create that kind of uh, respect to uh, what is wrong with learning from a healthy uh, elder you know in terms of a uh, uh, you, when you have basic uh, ailment even all the way from you have a headache or i cannot sleep and how did they manage and maybe that is where we need to create our research mind instead of looking at the literature where 90% of the literature come from the western sources you know uh, maybe we need to create or build up theories based on this they are the oral tradition passed on from generation after generation after generation that is what they do even in ethnic enclaves you know but unfortunately mm -hmm. there is a fear of punishment built into these traditional healers and they are afraid to come out and because you know they'll be put in jail because they do not have credentials and um so We're somewhere not afraid other, anymore yeah <laughs> what what i meant is you know somewhere <laughs> other people like us we need to uh, venture out you know so that's the one yeah. way we can do something yeah i and i'll be quick and brief i think um, the most profound thing you can do is live whatever it is that you are practicing if you're a christian live those tenets if you're a muslim live the quran if you're you know an atheist you be kind right and if you practice any of these traditions these alternative spiritual medicines as we say we just finished the bufo ceremony today you live the medicine and you know that in spanish they say el amor sana love heals and it's not just some new it's no love heals so don't you are pure love you've just been conditioned to think that you need love from anybody you don't you were born with it it was the essence of who you are and because you grew up in a traumatic society it's disconnected us to who we are which leaves us not confident in who we are as a human being but if you look at any child from 0 to 7 they are living in pure love they're in imagination they're in the theta brain waves of imagination where people get hypnotized to go to they're already in it so remember who you were as a child because that's that's essentially you're going to go through a journey to get back to that essence of pure love and pure love can change the world as many prophets around the world have shown so be what it is that you are seeking don't worry about healing people don't worry about changing people if you're a social worker don't worry about you got to no work on yourself and you will become that that magic wand so to speak yeah by the way uh, jamie and mahak if you get a chance the town i am talking about is called loma linda Yes, I think one of our attendees actually identified it. Um Somebody said that, yeah. Yes, Stephanie said it's the Seventh okay. Day Adventist in Loma Linda. Yeah. If you get a chance, please drive through there, you know. And 
it is another world altogether out there you know and uh, the same way you know i encourage before we all leave please venture out into these ethnic enclaves you know all the way from uh, i know we all know china town but there are small town like uh, armenian town you can go filipino there filipino town yeah yeah Korea and uh, yep. yeah and uh, and india town you know and there are all kinds of you know i spend a lot of hours with them you know and once they trust you they let you talk and there is even a restaurant in the india town i went and you tell them oh i have a stomach upset i have a gas trouble and they give you a a particular uh, menu and they give you a particular food to eat you know uh, and uh, i know they are not physician they are just a uh, uh, cook you know but they know what is good for you and if you talk to your mm-hmm. own uh, grandparents i'm sure they tell you what is good for you to eat you know and uh, if you cannot sleep or you know you are doing this 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 you know and i think some we need to bring traditions more into healing uh, into modern uh, medicine that's my, my humble suggestion just going to leave you last thing okay. check me out uh, my website is divineforces.org or follow me at fidel t rodriguez at, on instagram thank you jamie and mahak and dr nair i love you thank you thank you for all your work